selling 120 million records, starring in seven films and headlining three solo arena tours. The biggest selling female artist of the decade is still excited about new challenges and humbled by success. Everything that I'm involved with, I'm really passionate about. And I feel like, you know, as long as you believe in, in something, you can do it. And um, I'm really blessed to have all these opportunities. Welcome to the incredible world of Beyonce Giselle Knowles. With all that she has accomplished, it's hard to believe that Beyonce Knowles is still only in her 20s. Even she has to admit that life is pretty good. I'm very blessed I've had an amazing family and I think I have unconditional love. And regardless if I'm a celebrity, singer, whatever, I have a life outside of, of that. I don't define my life um, by my by my success as a star, superstar, whatever you want to call it. I do what I do because I love it and I'm grateful that I have support and um, people that tell me the truth in my life. Her charmed life began in Houston, Texas in 1981. She signed up for ballet and jazz dance classes in elementary school. And despite being a shy child, it soon became clear that she could also belt out a tune. By the age of seven, she was winning talent competitions. And just one year later, she and best friend Kelly Rowland were rapping and dancing in a group called Girls' Time, which went on to become Destiny's Child. Beyonce's salesman father, Matthew, had so much faith in his eldest daughter's talent that he abandoned his six-figure salary to manage her singing career. That bold decision was rewarded in 1996 when Destiny's Child were signed to Columbia Records. Although Beyonce was just 15 years old, she had already won over 30 singing and dancing competitions in her native Houston. The group, which included another of Beyonce's childhood friends, Latavia Robertson, as well as Latoya Luckett, recorded a song called Killing Time which found its way onto the Men in Black soundtrack in 1997. That was swiftly followed up by their self-titled debut album. The album went gold and featured the lead single, No, No, No. First time I heard myself on the radio was actually picking my little sister up from school, who's not a little sister anymore, but then she was a baby. And it was all of the girls from Destiny's Child. And as soon as we pulled up, the bell rang and we heard no, no, no on the radio and we ran out of the car. We ran around the car and dropped everything and was screaming and it was like a movie scene. And my sister was really embarrassed when she walked out to see us acting a plum fool until she realized it was our song on the radio. <laughs> Still, she had to wait another year to hit the big time. Destiny's Child's second album, The Writings on the Wall, peaked at number five on the Billboard 200 and spawned the number one singles, Bills, 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 and Say My Name. In the year 2000, the group saw a few lineup changes, with Latoya and Latavia being replaced by Michelle Williams and Farrah Franklin. Farrah dropped out, clearing the way for Beyonce, Kelly, and Michelle. Although Michelle has since admitted to battling insecurity in the early days of joining the trio, Kelly and Beyonce made her feel part of the Destiny's Child family. It's like a marriage. You know how you need communication? You need love and loyalty and mm -hmm. uh, trust. Uh, what else, ladies? It's very few times that, you know, you have, you find that, 
that perfect person that's that's right. really rare so it's not easy and is it isn't like one thing that you can say it just has to be natural right. and we don't have to force our friendship right. we just really enjoy each other mm -hmm. and it was always natural for us Michelle joined the group just in time to record their third album Survivor co-produced by Beyonce the album went straight to number one on the Billboard charts and spawned the hits Independent Woman Part 1, Bootylicious, and the title single Survivor, written by Beyonce and her father Matthew. Survivor went on to win the group their third Grammy Award for Best R&B Performance by a Duo or Group. After racking up several Billboard Music Honors, two Soul Train Lady of Soul Awards, as well as an American Music Award, they took some time out to concentrate on solo projects. After three years apart, they headed back to the studio as a trio to record their fourth and final album together. This time, all three members took on writing and producing duties, and Beyonce was delighted with the result. It's called Destiny Fulfilled, and I'm really excited because I, I know that it's the best album we've ever done. There's no doubt about that. The album went on to sell nearly half a million copies in its first week, confirming their status as the biggest selling girl group of all time. Topping it all off with a worldwide concert tour to promote the album, they announced to fans in June 2005 that after 14 years together, it was time to go their separate ways and pursue their individual goals. like the word breakup. <laughs> it sounds really Something sad. To <laughs> we 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 like to say that it's the end of, of a chapter in our lives. Um and it's been fourteen years. Um and everything cannot last forever. Um Destiny Fulfilled is the title of the album, is not a coincidence. This was something that we thought about, mm -hmm. and it was really important for us to end this chapter when we were successful mm -hmm. still, and not because one person wants to go solo, or not because we, we don't other. like each other, or because we're not selling records anymore, but because it has to end at, at a certain point, and we all have different personal things we want to do and things with our careers that we want to do. And as far as Beyonce was concerned, the three of them had formed a bond that would never be broken. They'd become more like sisters than workmates. We all eventually want to have families and kids, and um, we always joke and say we want to have our kids at the same time. Mm -hmm. Even if we don't have men, we'll just... Do it anyway. <laughs> <laughs> or you get hugged, married. Oh, you get married today? Okay. Oh, I'm gonna wear you, white you too. You be nice. Come on, let's go get married. <laughs> <laughs> um, but we each, I mean, we all want to do Broadway. We want to do movies. We want to do everything. Yeah. <laughs> We're still and we want to support each other while yeah. each other's doing it too. For the relative newcomer Michelle, there were no regrets. We're happy. You know, and we we made history. We did something that you know has not been done um, amongst female amongst a female group. You know, and um, there was press about it, but not as much as there was about the statement that we just made. And even in that statement, there was love in that statement. And in fact, that wasn't to be their last public appearance together. Eight months later, they teamed up again to receive a star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame. It was a chance for Beyonce to reflect on the journey that had begun more than 15 years earlier. I want to thank all of everyone for being here and thank you for supporting us. We started when we were nine years old and here we are getting a Hollywood star. Dreams come true. So thank you all so much for supporting us. God bless you. It also gave her proud mother, Tina, the opportunity to pay her own personal tribute. I remember when the girls were 15 and they first heard their first single and they were so excited and their whole thing was, we just want to go gold. 
we want to have a gold record and we want to attend the Grammys, not get one. And 10 Grammys later, 52 million records later, this is like a dream come true. So uh, thanks for giving them this great honor and they are very deserving because they remained as beautiful on the inside as outside. At just 25 years of age, Beyonce had not only fulfilled her destiny, she was already three years into a successful solo career, which began with the release of Dangerously in Love in 2003. Sitting in the producer seat, she collaborated with big names like Missy Elliott, Big Boy, Sean Paul, and boyfriend Jay-Z to showcase a more intimate side of herself than she was able to reveal as part of a group. Basically, I wanted people to get a feel for me. And the album is vulnerable. It's a lot more vulnerable than Destiny's Child's album because we've always been really strong. And I'm still strong, but I wanted people to, to see me differently and realize that I'm still human. Determined to get everything right for his daughter's big debut, her dad, Matthew, kept pushing back the release of the album. And after long deliberations about which single to put out first, they settled on Crazy in Love, and the album was finally released in June 2003. Much to Beyonce's relief. I'm very anxious. I'm very excited. I'm just... I'm happy. <laughs> um, I have so many great things happening for me right now. And I'm nervous, but the nervousness is good. It makes me feel like, okay, something is going to happen. And she was right. Dangerously in Love debuted at number one on the Billboard 200, selling over 300,000 copies in the first week and eventually clocking up sales of five million worldwide. Best pal Kelly Rowland was thrilled for her Destiny's Child bandmate. Yes, I think it's amazing. I think it's amazing. She really put her foot in it. She's really excited about the record. I'm happy for her. I'm excited for her. Definitely. Having already earned her Best Female Artist at the Billboard Music Awards and three MTV Video Music Awards, Dangerously in Love looks set to clean up at the 2004 Grammy Awards, where Beyonce was scheduled to perform with Prince. She ended up going home with a massive haul of five Grammys, including Best Female R&B Vocal Performance for Dangerously in Love 2, Best R&B Song for Crazy in Love, and Best Contemporary R&B Album. At the end of the big night, she couldn't quite take it all in. I'm very excited. I can't believe tonight I'm, I'm just I'm about to celebrate with Tony, and I can't believe I performed with Prince. I still can't believe it. I have to see it to believe it. It's just, it was unbelievable. I learned so much from him, and he's truly a spectacular artist. And you had all the success tonight. Are you having to pinch yourself? Does it seem real? I really, I cannot believe it. I'm like this. Like, I don't know, I don't know what to feel. I'm just, it's unbelievable. Where do you think you're going to put all these Grammys? Um, I have three. My mother has three, actually, from Destiny's Child, so I'll probably put them. The other five. <laughs> That's crazy. After that, Beyonce was everywhere, performing at every prestigious event from the Super Bowl to the 2005 Academy Awards, where she upped the ante by singing to a television viewing audience of millions in French. Fearless as ever, she didn't flinch. It was... Amazing, actually. I was more nervous in rehearsals. When I got there, I was confident, and, and I did it, and I'm very proud. I can't wait to go home and watch it. <laughs> also on the agenda was her final album with Destiny's Child and getting serious about yet another career as an actress. I haven't even been a leading lady yet, which has been my choice because I want to make sure that I'm, I know exactly what I'm doing when I do it, but I have that. I have so much more to do. 
With so many things on her to-do list, Beyonce was forced to postpone plans to record a follow-up to Dangerously in Love until early 2006. Finally, she was able to squeeze in the time to sit down with collaborators Rich Harrison, Rodney Jenkins, and Sean Garrett to work on a new album. She decided to call it B-Day, and its U.S. release was coordinated to coincide with her quarter-century anniversary on 4th of September 2006. The best birthday gift is for my album to be received really well. Um, and I, I think I'm just going to have like an intimate dinner with, with my friends and hopefully some good food. I'm going to have a party after um, an award show in, in New York on the 31st, but it's going to be like a big party with a lot of people, so I won't be able to relax. So I'll do it on my actual birthday, just at home, private intimate dinner. Instead, she decided to spend the big day kicking her heels up with fans in Japan. There were more celebrations after B-Day hit the top of the Billboard charts, with sales of more than half a million in its first week of release. Irreplaceable stayed on top of the Billboard Hot 100 for 10 straight weeks, giving Beyonce the most successful single of her career. She also had a UK number one with Deja Vu. The following year, she released the B-Day Anthology video album. I always wanted to do a video album. While I was recording the songs, I could see the videos in my mind, but I didn't have time to do it before the release. So I said, I'm gonna re-release the album when I have time and do a video for each song. That mammoth job entailed filming eight videos in the space of just two weeks. It was all hands on deck. It was difficult. I did eight videos in two weeks which I don't know if anyone's ever done that. I can't believe I did it, but I had a lot of help and a lot of support. Um, my hair and makeup team and my, my wardrobe, my mother and Ty and um, my choreographer, we all worked together and we were just grinding it out. As if that hadn't been keeping her busy enough, she also put together a deluxe edition of the B-Day album featuring brand new tracks and Spanish versions of some of the songs. I decided to, to write some new songs that were a little more personal because B-Day was so aggressive. And I also did six songs in Spanish because my friends were, you know, impressed when Destiny's Child sang with Alejandro Sanz a couple years ago at the Grammys. And they were like, you have to do some more Spanish. You sound like, you know, you speak Spanish. So I tried it and Irreplaceable was was so well well received. I decided to do a couple more. Then it was back out on the road for her second solo concert tour. Supported by an all-female band of musicians, the Beyonce Experience kicked off in Tokyo on April 10th. As well as taking in Australia, the US, and Europe, the 90-stop tour stopped off in Shanghai to mark her first concert performance in mainland China. She also made it to Addis Ababa, Bangkok, and Mumbai much to the delight of her Indian fans. One of the few major stars that actually come to India, which is it's like no one comes here, first of all. And when Beyonce, who's got the moves, she's got the voice, she's got the talent comes here, you're like, I have to come for Beyonce. <laughs> After one of her many costume changes during the Indian concert, she took to the stage in a traditional sari to sing Dangerously in Love. While there were no wardrobe malfunctions on that night, during a concert in Orlando, she got her heel caught in her floor-length jacket and tripped down a flight of stairs. The incident was recorded on a fan's mobile phone and became a hit on YouTube. It even found its way onto the nightly news on U.S. network CNN. But even that didn't slow her down. After picking up yet another Grammy for Best R&B Contemporary Album, 
she knuckled down to the job of recording her third solo album, I Am Sasha Fierce. And I actually wanted to reveal more of myself, so I, I named half of it I Am. And I'm really excited about this side of the album because the music is so classic and beautiful and it's a lot of acoustic guitar and you can kind of hear it a little bit with this first single, If I Were a Boy. And it's just beautiful songs no matter what the music is. Sasha Fierce is the character she likes to adopt when performing on stage whom Beyonce insists is much more bold and brassy than her real-life persona. Uh, I love to dance. I love to dance on stage and in videos. Um, I think people will be surprised to see me dance in, in real life. I'm really a lot more reserved and kind of shy. Um, I kind of do the two-step that I saw my parents do. <laughs> I, don't, I, I can't bust into choreography in an intimate setting. <laughs> While some people she meets are surprised at the contradiction between her on and off stage personalities, she believes she's no different from most other performers. Actually, every, every person I believe has that. When it's time for them to work, to work no matter how tired you are, you just kind of put it on. And, um, and I, I feel like every performer I've met, they all have that, that character they've created on the stage and um, that's something really special for the fans so I wanted to give them that side and also show them who I really am. Following the release of its first two singles, If I Were a Boy and Single Ladies, I Am Sasha Fierce hit the record stores and internet in November 2008, ahead of scheduled plans to get back out on tour in 2009. It's so difficult. I, I think I'm doing like 40 songs and um, I, I do the arrangements with my band and that rehearsal time is so hard because, you know, people come and they all have their favorite songs and I, like, I want to always give the fans what they want, but I'm doing all the songs. I just do have to get creative with the amount and how to put them together so I can get them all together in two hours. On the top of that, she had to contend with the problem of rehearsals for the shows leaking onto the internet and spoiling the surprise for her fans. It's very frustrating now because, you know, it's great because people can get a little sneak peek and say, oh, I want to come to the show or, oh, I don't want to go to that show. <laughs> and, I, you know, I'm fans of people, so I go on there and check it out too. But, you know, you put so much of your heart and time into the wardrobe and making sure it's these reveals and the costumes and the lights. And then, you know, it, it's kind of unfortunate that people can see the show uh, months before you get into their city. But, you know, it's life. That's, what, that's how we live now. It's all very different. Reviews of the I Am Tour had critics falling over themselves to do it justice. One reviewer wrote, there is breathtaking elegance in her acute desire to entertain. Lorraine Schwartz of The Examiner decreed, in less than a year, I've seen Madonna, Britney, and Beyonce. Beyonce was by far the best of the three. While Newsday wrote, she proves that hot choreography and strong vocals don't have to be mutually exclusive. No worries of lip syncing here. And by this time, many people were wondering just how she did it. Finished the, the last tour a year ago, and now here I am. I'm going to be on the tour for another year. Um, thank God I love what I do, and, and I have time in between. But, you know, I'm so excited, and this is what I, I was born to do. So it's my life, you know, and I couldn't imagine not being on tour doing records, so I have the time of my life on the stage. Not content with having the time of her life on stage and in the studio, Beyonce has also somehow found the time and energy to put together an impressive film career, which began with the made-for-TV film Carmen, a Hip Hopper. Next, she played the gun-toting, afro-wearing Foxy Cleopatra in the Austin Powers sequel, Goldmember. Then, in 2003, 
she starred in The Fighting Temptations as a gospel choir singer and got the big thumbs up from her seasoned co-star, Cuba Gooding Jr. Beyonce is beautiful, and not only that, she's a songstress, but she can act. <laughs> but being only her second big screen role, she was nervous about how it would turn out. I was terrified. I was terrified. And the first time I saw this, the same feeling, but I was so critical the first time. The second time was a little better. Now I can really watch it. She still hadn't got over her screen fright by the time she arrived on set for the shooting of a remake of the 60s film comedy series, The Pink Panther. But director Sean Levy helped her overcome her fears. Beyonce and I spent a week rehearsing. So we just went right at the fact that she's not an actress, it's not her day job, and let's not pretend that there is an anxiety. In the end, however, she took it all in her stride. Well, um, it wasn't very difficult. I didn't have to do much research. I was playing an international singer. Um, and it was, it was so easy, it took me a couple weeks and I got to work with the best Steve Martin and Kevin Klein, who I grew up watching their movies, and now here I am in another. Although she could have done without the extra challenge of trying to keep a straight face while working alongside a rather distracting co-star in Steve Martin. I have to just be serious. I have to stay in character play it straight, and um, I can laugh after when I watch the playback. <laughs> but she wasn't going to let anything get in the way of her ambition. You know, I admire Barbara Streisand, Cher, Diana Ross, and they, they sang in a lot of their movies, but when they acted, they really acted, and they were really good. It doesn't matter to me. I eventually want to do a really big musical. That's my dream. As usual, she didn't have to wait long. Within two years, she nailed her starring role in the big screen adaptation of 80s Broadway musical Dream Girls, about all-girl group The Dreamettes. Despite the obvious similarities between her character's life and her own, there were many more differences. Dina grew up in the projects of Detroit. I grew up in private school. I mean, I grew up with, you know, a middle-class life and I, my drive does not come from me trying to get myself out of um, the projects. Yeah. My drive comes from seeing my parents be successful and have drive and, and you know, my love for music. And, I mean, the dynamics in Destiny's Child is very different from Dina. Another marked difference between her and her on-screen character was Dina's lack of a big singing voice. Having to play down her own vocal capacity was just one of the many challenges of the role. The hardest thing was um, me knowing that I couldn't depend on, on my voice because it was written in the script that, that Dina didn't have a strong voice. So I also didn't have too much dialogue, so I had to say so many things without saying anything, which is difficult. Um, and of course, losing weight and, and the rehearsals and, and the, the studio was really not the hard part. It was mainly the dialogue and the things and getting over my nervousness and, and making sure I, I was secure about my performance. Of course, the hard work only made it more worthwhile when the New York premiere rolled around. I knew this was going to be magical and this was going to be challenging, but that's what I loved about it because, you know, I, I haven't ever played a part that's had so much growth and that's such a real flawed person um, and she's very different from, from myself, so I had to work really hard in making sure that I was able to, to be as calm and controlled as, as the character. And, I worked for six months with an acting coach and Bill, and, and now here I am. 
Her efforts were rewarded with two Golden Globe nominations and an Oscar nomination for the song she wrote and performed, Listen. By now, she'd become a dad hand at switching back and forth between careers. It's, it's really interesting how the movies inspire the music and the music inspires the movie. When, whenever I do an album and I do all this, all the touring, and then I'm like, okay, after a year of it, I want to do something else. And I love the stability of the movies, and I just love doing something that I'm still learning. I'm new at. It's, it's almost like starting over, which is really exciting. And then when I do that, the movie, I'm like, okay, I got to get back in the studio. I want to go perform every night. So it keeps my life interesting, and that's, that's my goal, to keep growing and keep, keep learning and becoming more of an artist. And I'm, I'm happy I've been given the opportunities to do both. She went on to prove that commitment by producing as well as starring in Cadillac Records, about real-life heroin-addicted soul singer Etta James. It was so fun. Um, the hardest thing, probably the emotional scenes. Every day I would come home with swollen eyes and um, having to, to think about the most painful things that have happened to me in my life um, just so I can give an honest performance. It was difficult because I'm, I'm not a person that dwells on negativity. and It was hard, but, you know, it was necessary, and I think I, I gave the best performance of my life. Co-star Adrian Brody agreed. She's so impressive. Uh, I, I was blown away, actually. I mean, she she's a hard worker and immensely talented, and she sang so beautifully and was connected emotionally to the to the hard stuff, the the real uh, the vulnerability of Etta James, and and I, I, I was really impressed. And so were the critics. Beyonce's performance earned her a Satellite Award nomination, as well as an NAACP nod for the Most Outstanding Supporting Actress. Her next challenge was to take on a role that didn't allow her to fall back on her singing skills in Obsessed. Her co-star in the movie, Idris Elba, admired her bravery. Especially great because she, you know, she came with open arms to just embrace this character. You know, in, in this case, she's not playing a singer or anything like that. She's more comfortable with. It's a very, very uh, a big challenge for us. So, did a good job. For Beyonce, the role of a happy homemaker who turns into a kicking and screaming wife and mother when her family life is threatened by an obsessive stalker, forced her to really dig deep. This was really serious and it came from an emotional place. So anything that was really painful and anything that I have to fight in my life, um, that's what I thought about. So it was way deeper than the exterior, way deeper than dancing or performing or being, you know, fierce on the stage. It was a far cry from having fun as Sasha Fierce on stage. And I did a lot of substitution and the same things that I do to prepare for other roles because I'm a heavy believer in putting in a lot of work for movies. Mm -hmm. Even for the scenes that are funny or the fighting, instead of just relying on the choreography, I wanted to emotionally be believable and be as crazy as a woman would be if a, someone touched their child. <laughs> It also made her think very deeply about her own vulnerability. Thank God I've never had anything like this happen, and I pray that it never does. I don't think it will, because fortunately, the crazy obsessed people that are in my life, in Jay's life, we have really good security. <laughs> so hopefully I won't have to be in there fighting, but you know I'm a Houston girl, so if I have to, I'll put a little throw in there if I need to. Throughout her wildly successful careers in music and film, Beyonce has remained incredibly close to her family. Her father, Matthew, manages her music career 
while her mother, Tina, designs her costumes. My mother's my stylist. She pulls all the clothes with Ty Hunter, my other stylist. And it's great working with her. For one, she's my best friend, and I admire her. And if I could be like anyone, it would be her, because she's just a, such a strong, smart, beautiful woman. Adding yet another string to her bow, she and Tina decided to launch their own ready-to-wear fashion line called the House of Darion. At the launch in 2005, Beyonce tried to sum up the House of Darion in three words. Well, couture, kick, and soul. Actually, my mother represents the couture. Um, I represent the kick, and my grandmother, who is Miss Derwan, we named the House of Derwan our line after, is the soul. Since then, the House of Darion has branched out into the world of mobile gaming with a social networking game called Beyonce Fashion Diva. The Darion launch followed her collaboration with Tommy Hilfiger as the face of their new fragrance, True Star. People ask me, why Beyonce? And it's a very simple answer, and I'm sure you all know the answer. Beyonce is a true star, and she is a true star in the true sense of the word. The perfume proved so popular that it was quickly followed up by True Star Gold. Then in 2007, prestigious fashion house Armani introduced Beyonce as the face and voice of their new fragrance, Diamonds. The launch at Macy's department store in New York gave her a rare opportunity to get up close and personal with her fans. and I don't get to really touch the people that are impacted by my music. And it's so beautiful for me to be able to actually shake their hands and to hear the impact that my music has had on everyone's lives. It's, it's really overwhelming for me, and it's, I'm so grateful for these opportunities. She and her younger sister, Solange, also recently teamed up to promote a line of Mickey Mouse-themed accessories in Japan. According to Forbes magazine, that endorsement deal helped to take Beyonce's earnings up to $87 million between June 2008 and 2009, bringing her in at number four on the 2009 Forbes Celebrity 100 list. In terms of influence and earnings, that put her ahead of husband Jay-Z, who came in at number seven, and whose own remarkable achievements have made him one of the richest hip-hop artists in the industry. Originally christened Sean Carter, Jay-Z grew up in the tough housing projects of Brooklyn, New York. Abandoned by his father at 12, having once shot his brother in the shoulder, and with the occasional dabbling in drugs, life was not looking too promising for the young Carter. Luckily, though, fate had other ideas. Keeping his brothers awake at night by banging out endless drum patterns on the kitchen table, Sean's musical abilities were beginning to flourish. His constant freestyling, lyric writing, and obsession with rap earned him the nickname Jazzy, and it wasn't long before Sean began to see music as his one-way ticket out of the crime-infested neighborhood. You know, you, you see how, you see the cycle. It happens all the time in, in, pro, in the projects, you know. Um, you, you, you do, you ha you're having a certain life and it leads, no, it leads either to jail or it leads to death. So, I mean, it's, it's up to you to change it. And for me, it was like, what I'm going to do? Like, I'm going to just keep running the streets forever. What I'm going to do when I get 30? You know what I'm saying? That, that, that always stuck with me. So, I, and I had a talent to rap, but it was, it was a gift. And I didn't recognize it as a gift in the beginning because it was a gift. So it came easy for me to put words together. And my mom will always be like, you know, anything that, that you want, you gotta work hard for. Although now fully concentrating on music and beginning to generate positive feedback, no major label would give Jay-Z a second look. His only option was to start up his own independent label. He named it Rockefeller Records and released Reasonable Doubt in 1996. 
I, that that's my you know my favorite album. That's my baby right there. I have so many special songs. As far as the guest appearances, I'm just amazed at the people and the level of talent that I got on it between Mary and Big. You know, having having both of them on that album. That, you got to remember, I was an artist out of nowhere. I didn't have a single out on anybody's record. I didn't have a record deal that everyone was talking about. You know, I just came out of nowhere, and to have those type of um, that level of talent on on your debut album, you know, it was a blessing. I mean, everything just worked out. As well as heading up his original independent label, Rockefeller Records, he served for three years as president and CEO of hip hop super label Def Jam Recordings. His aim in taking over the position in 2005 was to bring an artist perspective to the top job. Given the power to make or break new artists, his priority was to protect the integrity of signed acts and to make it all about the music. I like to say that the inmates run in the asylum now. You have to let people infiltrate the system in order to correct it. You have to get in there. People that's outside of the system have to get inside the system in order for it to be better, in order for uh, people not to take advantage of artists, in order for people to care more about the music, you know, than um, quarterly numbers. As if running two record companies and a highly successful performing career weren't enough, Jay-Z was also one of the first artists to extend his reach beyond music and into the fashion industry. In 1999, he teamed up with business partner Damon Dash to launch Rockaware, an urban clothing line that soon expanded its range to include everything from socks and sandals to sunglasses, and now boasts an annual turnover of $700 million. After selling the rights to the Rockaware brand Iconics for a cool $204 million, Jay-Z can afford to be a little smug. You know, in the beginning, people thought hip-hop was just a passing fat, and that's what people say about urban apparel groups, you know, companies. You know, they say that, you know, it's just this thing that happens over a couple summers and then you go away. But, you know, we started this in 1999, and we're still here, still like number one in our sector, so still here. Despite selling the rights to Rockaware, he has retained his stake in the company and still oversees the marketing, licensing and development of new products, like a new social networking site that offers style and music news. But for Jay-Z, Rockaware is much more than a money-making venture. So I'm very hands-on. I'm hands-on. I mean, I've become lately, um, in the last three, three years, you know, I'm here, on, you know, on a daily basis, but, uh, you know, I'm very hands-on with the designs, the marketing of it, and, you know, just the overall, the overall look and feel of Rockaway because it's my voice. And partly due to his success as a fashion mogul, when Reebok approached him to create his own sneaker, the boy from the wrong side of New York couldn't believe his luck. I figured I'd grow up in the project, you know what I'm saying, and we had to prepare to get shoes. It took us months, we had to save up and uh, take out trash and do chores to get sneakers. So, I mean, to go from that to having your own sneaker, just the most incredible thing in the world. It went on to become the fastest selling product in Reebok stores around the globe. Jay-Z had become the artist and entrepreneur of the moment, and it seemed that everything he touched turned to gold. In recognition of his uncanny ability to tap into the zeitgeist, he was named 2006 GQ Renaissance Mogul by GQ Magazine. It's the standard, right? It's the standards where you look to see if you're on, on pace, or, you know, hopefully ahead of time. Together, Beyonce and Jay-Z have become the most powerful celebrity couple in the world. Far outranking the likes of Tom Cruise and Katie Holmes, and Angelina Jolie and Brad Pitt. According to luxury lingerie label Victoria's Secret, they can also lay claim to being the world's sexiest couple. While Beyonce continues to sell millions of albums, stage sellout tours, collect accolades, and compile an impressive acting CV, Jay-Z reigns supreme as the world's richest rapper with an estimated net worth of 340 million U.S. dollars. Despite their respective high profiles, 
Beyonce and Jay-Z have done their best to keep their love life out of the public eye. With Jay-Z once stating, we don't play with our relationship. Rumors of their romance date all the way back to Beyonce's Destiny's Child days. But solid reports first emerged after Beyonce appeared in the video to Jay's 2003 single, Bonnie and Clyde. Later in the same year, they also collaborated on Beyonce's smash, Crazy in Love. But in 2006, Beyonce shouted down rumors that they were about to tie the knot. I don't have no wedding plans. See, we've been, and we've been reading all about it. It's like, I, you have no wedding plans? No, I'm not where rushing. Are they, where are they getting this? I, they've been saying it about every celebrity for ever. You know, it's not personal. They, they do it to everyone. Finally, however, in April 2008, the cat was out of the bag after they made an early morning trip to Scarsdale Village Hall in New York. Oh, I think that's so exciting. It's fun, it's exciting, and I can't believe they came all the way here to get a marriage license. That's very nice. The press duly camped outside of Jay-Z's apartment, hoping to get a snap of the newly betrothed. Having finally found a window in their crazy schedules to put a ring on it, Beyonce got around to confirming the news in the opening montage of a video to launch her album, I Am Sasha Fierce. Since then, they've been less shy about appearing together in public and have become regular fixtures at each other's premieres and awards nights. On the subject of starting a family, Beyonce won't be drawn except to say it will definitely happen someday. It could happen in a year, it could happen in five years, but I'm, I'm in no rush, and I do think family is really, really important. I grew up with both of my parents and with my sister and my cousin and with Kelly and all the girls, and it was always a lot of love in my house, so I want the same thing. In the meantime, with a fourth studio album in the works, it looks like this Bootylicious Babe won't be settling down just yet.